Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone coming in now. We are here at the Asala Richmond Sunday sit-in. We will be starting shortly. It's about 3.57 right now on a cold winter, well, fall day. And um, I just wanna say welcome and sit back, relax. We'll be with you shortly. I can't wait to hear our information today. Looking forward to it. See you shortly. Good afternoon, everyone. We'll be starting shortly. It's 3.58. Thank you so much for being here today with us in uh, the Asala sit-in. Um, we have some excellent information today, and I look forward to sharing it with everyone. Give us a few more minutes. We're waiting for, for people to log in, and once we get everyone situated, we will start. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's about, well, actually it's four o'clock. I wanna start this session at about 4.02, letting a few people, a few more people in. Um, we've got a few people coming in now and um, we'll start at 4.02. Sit back, relax, hopefully you had a snack. Get your pencil and your paper because I know Dr. Shelley Murphy has a lot of information to share with us today. 402 will be starting. Good afternoon, everyone. It's 402 by my clock, and I want to welcome everyone here to our Asala Richmond's, Richmond, Virginia's second Sunday sit-in, sponsored by AARP. My name is Michelle Evans Oliver, and I am the president of Asala Richmond, Virginia. I am so happy to see all of you today. I am also excited to let you all know that we've partnered this, this Sunday sit-in with AUGS, the Greater Richmond Chapter of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. That is, um, at the helm is Larry Clark. He is here. You can see his wonderful picture on the screen. Thank you, Larry, for all that you are doing and partnering with us. 
We really appreciate it. Also, I would like to have um, the Asala and OGS members to put their information or just everyone, just put their information in the chat of where you're from. And if you're a part of OGS or Asala, tell us what branch you're part of or chapter you're, you're with. I really appreciate that. All right, so the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History was founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson in 1915. Our Richmond, Virginia branch was chartered in the middle of the pandemic, 2020, but that didn't stop us. And this was a great time to start a, a branch. So we've been starting and, and we've been having programs ever since. So every Sunday in the month of November, our Sunday sit-ins will be presented by Dr. Shelley Murphy, our resident genealogist, world-renowned genealogist. And so last week, our topic was finally remembered Black revolutionary patriots. The information was stimulating and thought-provoking. If you would like to view last week's Sunday sit-in, you can go to our, our Asala Richmond Facebook page, and you can click on our Sunday sit-in from last week and see it. It's great information. I'll put that link in the chat once I finish talking. Also, please like our Facebook page. We would love to have you to see what we, are ha what we have in store coming up. So that's where our, all of our information is stored for now. So before I get started and before, I mean, before Dr. Murphy gets started, I would like to introduce our sponsors, AARP Virginia. Uh, Belinda Todd, are you there? Let's see, let's take you off of mute. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, last week's discussion was so very interesting. So I'm looking forward to our discussion today or to hear Dr. Murphy. So I want you to know that I am a community volunteer with the Virginia State AARP. And we have a great uh, group of volunteers who come from all walks of life. They have many talents and they give their time to the community. But we're always looking for more volunteers. So if you're interested, please get in touch. I noticed that we have people here tonight from all across the country. So you have an AARP office near you. Our founder, uh, Dr. Ethel Percy Andrus was a lifelong learner, and she believed that we should partner with our local organizations to bring information uh, to the community. And so once again, we're just very proud to be a part of this. So Michelle, let's get it started. All right, all right. I love AARP Virginia. I love AUGS. I love Asala. Ashley, I'm a member of all three. As I look into the, the chat here, it looks like we have a lot of people who are members of two or three, and that's wonderful. I'm glad that everyone here is enjoying all three memberships. And if you haven't joined Augs Asala or AARP Virginia, please do, or an AARP Augs or Asala near you. Well, this Sunday, we have again, world-renowned genealogist, Dr. Shelley Murphy. Today's topic is Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. Yes, AARP Virginia and the Richmond Virginia chapter um, branch has always been working together and we want to have this information shared with all of you all. So let me give you a little bit more information about Dr. Shelley Murphy. She is working with the UVA's Descendant Project Researcher, where she joined the UVA Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in March 2021. Her background spans with nonprofit and local government work focusing primarily on real estate, affordable housing, and fair housing discrimination issues. An avid genealogist for over 30 years, Dr. Shelley Viola Murphy, also known as Family Tree Girl, was born and raised in Michigan, now living in Central Virginia. She conducts genealogy workshops at local, state, and national, local, state, and national conferences. Murphy is known for her inspiring and interactive So What with genealogical research, along with interesting problem-solving 
methodology lectures, such as using use of timelines. Dr. Murphy holds memberships in AUGS, NGS, APG, DAR, and local genealogy groups, and her personal research focuses on Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, Virginia, West Virginia, South Carolina, and Tennessee. Now, for those of you who are joining by Zoom, please submit your questions at the bottom. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A um, feature. If you don't, click on the more if you have a more and you will see your Q&A feature and ask your questions there. We will get to your questions at the end of Dr. Murphy's, Dr. Murphy's presentation. If you're joining us via Facebook or YouTube, we will try to get your questions answered in real time. We are streaming on Facebook on the AARP Virginia's Facebook page, and we will be streaming shortly on the A Asala Richmond Facebook page. Now, without further ado, Dr. Shelley Murphy, are you there? I am, and hello to everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get my PowerPoint presentation up here. And let's see, how's that? Perfect. All right. Well, thank you all for coming and spending the Sunday with Asala and Oggs from across the country. And I hope you enjoy what I'm going to share tonight. And if you have questions, like Michelle said, just put them in the chat box and we'll try to get to them. So I'm going to talk today about the Bureau of Refugee, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands and finding your people before 1870. So basically the overview is gonna be an introduction to the Freedmen Bureau, a little organizational chart, looking at the field offices, the microfilm, and also what benefits it is to researchers. You don't have to be a genealogist to be able to um, look and see where your people were at the end of the Civil War. I'll share how to access the records, and then we're going to look at some records, and then I'll give you a couple examples, okay? All right, so here's your introduction, and it is Record Group 105. The former title is called the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. Typically, people just say the Freedmen's Bureau or the Bureau. It is a federal record, and it's under the military. It was created March 3rd, 1865, basically at the end of the Civil War. And its goal was to, I need to move this out of the way. Um, the goal was to supervise the relief efforts, which included education, health care, food and clothing, uh, the refugee camps, legalizing of marriages, employment opportunities, and overseeing the labor contracts. Now, this was done to the refugees and the freedmen. Also, they assisted the Black soldiers and the sailors and any of their heirs that were after um, collecting the bounty claims or pensions, any of the back pay that was promised or due to them. The collection is going to be covering the period from 1865 to 1872. Now, there are some pre-bureau records that are going to run during the Civil War. So basically about 1863 on up to the opening. Those are going to be found um, throughout Mississippi, Louisiana, and then I've seen some for Fort Monroe, Virginia. So and there are certain places that you can access them. There is also various records that called destitute or transportation, and again, much, much more. So the Freedmen's Bank records are separate. They are separate from the Freedmen Bureau records, two different groups. They just got the same name as in Freedmen, so people think they're all together. But there was a Freedmen's Saving and Trust Company, and it ran from 1865 to 1874, and it's called Record Group 101, and you can see the link, you know, to access them, and it's also Microfilm Collection M816. 
what this was is where people went and opened up, I'm going to say, bank accounts, okay? And again, I'm going to talk about the other, the bureau versus the savings and trust. So that's open for another discussion or another presentation at another time. So one of the things that the bureau stated was their failures. So you think, okay, the civil, uh, civil war is over. So you have the refugees and you have the freedmen, which were formerly enslaved. And what the bureau basically said was one of the biggest problems that they faced was because they were underfunded and understaffed, and they really couldn't effectively carry out its policies. Now, we've heard this, and we hear this type of situation today in 2021. Also, the agents were subject to violence. The KKK was involved, other Southerners who just resented the Bureau because they were helping uh, people of color, Blacks. So who's in the Bureau? Let's be clear. Remember, it's a federal record. That means everybody can be in there, white, blacks, and so forth, okay? It's different than saying this is a state record or whatever, this is federal. The war is over, talking about the Civil War. The refugees, I've labeled them as poor whites or just white folks that were in need of assistance. Freedmen were formerly enslaved individuals and families. And of course, the abandoned lands would link to people returning their land to the former landowners, or it's going to be used for uh, some other source, okay? But remember, everybody could be in this record, whoever access these freedmen field offices, okay? So there's a little organizational chart. And the reason I want to say that, because I know there's a lot of experienced genealogists, you know, that are probably watching this. We know that there's field offices. This is typically um, where we go to to find information, but there's also different levels. Some of the field office, like Virginia, their records are indexed. So we can see the names that's in the records and we can search. Maybe in other states, they're not indexed or the collection is not totally indexed. But you also have a subassistant commissioner's level, assistant commissioner's level, which is a state level, and then you got national headquarters. So there's different levels. What we see in most tap into are the field office, which are cities, towns, and counties in the courthouses in specific areas. So which state had the most field offices? Yahoo, here we go, Virginia did. Look at the right, you can see the list of the microfilm numbers. So you can actually just Google and say M1900, you know, Freedman Bureau, and it's gonna pop up and it'll pop up where those records are located. And I'm gonna walk through each of the places that hold these records. So you can see the Freedman Bureau state offices that are on this chart. Not everybody is on here because you don't see Maryland and Delaware, but I'm at the United States Freedmen Assistant Commissioner level. So again, they're only showing these records that you would tap into. And of course, you've got the microfilm number or row that you can see over on the right-hand side. And again, we'll be going through this. So again, who had the most field office? Yes, Virginia right at the top with 203 rolls, records. Louisiana's number 211, Georgia, and then so forth, you can go on down. There's Kentucky 133 and South Carolina at 106. So the benefits to the researchers is just a plethora of information that you have access to. So number one, look at the list I have here. You got marriages, you got letters, complaints, reports, ration, labor contracts, teacher reports, because there's a whole education part of the Freedmen Bureau. There's applications for land. There could be medical records that state somebody's condition, 
former location before the Civil War. Look at the relationships. It's connecting time, place, and locations. Here's some more. Event dates. You could see ages, race, occupations. If you're researching your ancestors right after the Civil War or before 1870, these are the types of things that you want to be able to find. Look at birth dates. There could be marriages or former marriages, death dates. You could also see the former slave owners and so forth. Another thing is about how to access the Bureau. I've got a list here. You've got the National Archives. You've got FamilySearch.org. You've got Mapping the Freedmen Bureau, which is my favorite site, not just because a couple of my friends developed this, but because it's very easy to access and I use it every Friday. And we got the descriptive pamphlets that are also listed there, and I'll walk through that. Discoverfreedmen.org and, of course, Family Search and Ancestry.com backslash Freedmen. Here's a sample of the Freedmen's Bureau records and how to access them through this site. This is the one that is called Mapping the Freedmen Bureau. And Angela Walton Raji and Tony Carrier are the two that put this together. So what you're seeing is that down here on the lower left, you see the map and you see all the little red icons. Well, those icons either will say it's a field office, a hospital, it could be a bank branch, it could be a USCT battle site. So they pinned on the map through Google Maps all of these places that had attachment to the Freedmen Bureau. So when you open up, say, Virginia field offices, and I'm looking at the family search screen here, okay, you'll see counties and locations. This is not the complete list. I'm just going to take you right on into Louisa County Courthouse, which is one of the areas that I research for UVA. So once I tap on that little icon, you can see where the arrow's at and I selected Louisa, but look what's within the area around them. Those are telling me that they are designated field offices that were set up, okay? You see Charlottesville, you see Orange County, Culpeper, Fredericksburg, and so forth. And again, I am in the mapping site. Once you click on the red icon, a white box pops up and it says Louisa Courthouse, Louisa County and its field office. It gives the National Archives microfilm 1913, which is Virginia. And it's also in blue telling me that it's rows 103 and 104. Now, this is in Louisa Courthouse, and I am at the assistant subassistant commissioner level. Just so you know, I'm at the field office level. You can see where it's telling me it's row 103 and all the two components that's there, and then all the components that's going to be in row 104. See contracts, there's a register of Black persons in Louisa, legally married register of letters and reports. Remember the Freedmen Bureau records typically start 1865 and end 1872. So discoverfreedmen.org is also a route to get into the Bureau records, which takes you to Family Search, and you can input a name and it'll take you right there. Once you get in there, edit and put your location that you're looking for. Discoverfreedmen.org. Now you're looking at the screen inside Family Search, just as an example. You see Peter Briggs, and it says Virginia Freedman Bureau and 1865 to 1872. On the right-hand side, you see a little camera and you see a little document and it says view. That's where you click to pull up the record. 
ancestry just a month or so or two months ago um, released information about that they had uploaded um, 3.5 million Freedmen Bureau records. And you can also um, access the same records that they got on Family Search. So I'm sharing with you all the various ways. They're not three and a half million additional records. They're pretty much the same ones that are on Family Search. But when you're using Ancestry, you also will get the opportunity to see the hints like you normally do. And then they have them broken out here in these three categories. And of course, you see the Freedmen Bank records on the right. But you see the Bureau records for marriage and then the regular Bureau. And again, these records are rich. I can't wait to show you what you're going to find in these. And then again, this is their search opportunity from Ancestry where you can put a name. So again, the difference from looking at family search, you don't get the green leaf hints. And in Ancestry, you do. So also there's record and resources like this little red book I'm sharing, and that was called the Freedmen Bureau in Virginia, and I just highlighted the page that connected to Fluvanna County. So you can see it's saying that there's Freedmen names followed by their former owner in parentheses, and this is Fluvanna County. So you can see there's an unknown, then there's Willie, and then there's George Johnson, would, which who would have been the slave holder. So I'm giving you examples of what's out there. And this is available, I guess you can get on probably Amazon or at your historical society. So when you want to locate these records and resources, here's an additional one to help you think about um, getting into the Bureau and why you want to get into the Bureau. This is by another friend, Jean Cooper, and this book is called The Index to Records of the Antebellum Southern Plantation. The other places you want to check are the house repositories. You want to see where the recorded property records are at, where inventories or tax records are at, courthouses. Um, historical societies, library, and archives. Look for the plantation owners. Who were the neighbors? Look for the plantation owners, like I'm saying, using Jean's book. Or maybe you need to look in the birth, slave birth index book that was done by Alexandria Library. They're different than the ones that are online at Family Search, which is by the WPA. These books are on, they built five or six volumes of books on slave birth index. And again, I'm compiling because we're looking, there's reasons why we don't see them in the normal records because enslaved individuals were considered property. They're not gonna show up in the census and things like that. So let's take a look at some of these records. Here is uh, a record, and it's for binding out colored minor children. And again, I'm using an example of Fluvanna County. So I get the full name of somebody white, and I'm getting the full name of somebody colored. Here's another complaint in a letter that was submitted. And I raised it up and highlighted John Bro uh, Brockenbrough against A.S. Lumden. Lumden is white, Brockenbro is colored. So basically there was a complaint filed. Somebody took something and they went to the Freedmen Bureau Court. So I'm showing you an example of what a court hearing would be and there could be always a resolution. So if you know, when you look on a row and there's a complaint letter, that it's obvious there has to be the hearing and then the resolution. Accomack County, well, guess what? Yes, thanks to Selma Stewart out of Hampton Roads Ogs chapter, she said, did you know? And no, I didn't know. But Accomack County and maybe some other counties, they actually took a census in 1864. Yes, a colored census and a white census. But what's interesting and what's worth 
And exciting for us as researchers, if you look on the right, it says Negro census of the district, but you're getting name, you're getting age, you're getting occupation, right? Living with and when, and then there's remarks. And again, you want to make sure that you're scanning through. We want to know names. We want to know location, right? And if we can get age to research people that were formerly enslaved or even free people that would have accessed the Bureau, these are kind of things you want to look for. So again, you get name, age, occupation. Did they take an oath or not? And the oath could have applied to the white people, but it's not listed on the Negro census on the right. So the ones on the right are saying yes or oath taken or in the remarks it says was not at home. Again, information. We're also getting gender. Here's a sample of a marriage record. And this marriage record is out of Tennessee. Again, look what's there. We got names. We got dates. We got former slave owner and ages. Do not believe that myth that African-Americans cannot find their ancestors prior to 1870. This happens daily. I mean daily. And it's clearly saying, I certify that I, this day, I have this day united Joseph Providence and Mary Providence. Right there, they both got the same surname. That should tell you something. That could be a clue that they're coming from possibly the same, or pl same plantation. And then it says for Mary used to belong to, and it's got W. Hallen on there. Okay. It's given their ages. And you know what else it's saying? They went off. They're talking about Stephen, which is one of their children. Stephen, who was about 19 years old, went off with General General Wildress and with the U.S. Colored Troops. Now you got another generation that you just found. These records are rich and they are useful for your research. Here's another example of a marriage certificate. It's between Thomas and Jane Harris, right? This issue, this marriage record was issued in April of 1866. And again, the person that's marrying them saying, I have this day united Thomas Harris and Jane Harris, shoot, S-H-U-T-E, colored in the bonds of matrimony. They have been living together as man and wife for about 15 years past. The date of this record is 18. Um, it was issued in 1866, but you're getting the birth dates also of every one of their children. They've been living together for 15 years, so you can back up, right? And know where they're at 15 years. This is out of Lebanon, Tennessee, Wilson County. And again, it was on a different microfilm because it's different than the state of Virginia. But now look at all the children that you have and their birth dates. Here's a ration record for Fort Smith, Arkansas. And of course, rations is they're going to come to the field office. That means they need food or they're coming to get food. And this was issued again at Fort Smith, Arkansas. And this was in 1867. So if you look at the columns, you're going to get the name of the person, a number of adults, and a number of children, the date of issue, the number of days, the number of pounds of bacon, corn, and so forth. And also, it's going to signify what their race is. So you see colored, white, Cherokee, white, colored, white, colored, Cherokee, white federal record everything is that everybody is included and again this is arkansas okay this is one of my favorite ones but it's also an emotional emotional one i have a lot of little trouble when i go through some of these ration records this one is an example from uh saint landry 
Parish out of Louisiana. And it's only got a few people listed, but what you're going to get is the name, the age, the former slave owner. That's one of our biggest brick walls is trying to find who that former slave owner was. Location, of course, and there could be remarks. But what gets to me when this record was first shared with me, and it was by Nika Smith, and, and I was looking at that, and we both said, oh, my gosh. You know, you got two 100 year olds on here, a 84, a 80, and a 48 year old. This record was generated in January of 1867. Let's think about that. We got Miss Betsy on here. She's 100 years old. That means Betsy was here and enslaved prior to this country being independent of Great Britain, a, AKA the United States of America. Also, as a researcher, I have to sit back and think about this. Okay, so she's alive, probably been enslaved her whole life, 100 years, and think of all of what that 100 years entailed. And also, and again, if I had the time, I would research Miss Betsy here because I also have her slave owner's name and I would be looking for more information. Now, she's probably been enslaved her whole life, but you know what? To somebody, family, this ancestor might have been the one that first came off of a ship because we're talking about 100 years old. And again, back to 1767. And you just think of what in the world could she had lived through, but you know what? She lived through it. She's a hundred. And those descendants would be the evidence that this woman is probably very resilient. And so again, if I had the chance, I would research her because these type records, you know, we got names, we got location, we got the former slaveholder name, and we might have remarks as far as their health. So here's a labor contract between Friedman Horace Brown and a Thomas Birch in an AC trundle. $10 a month for 12 months. This is in Charlottesville. And it was done in 1866. Your labor contracts have the typical language. Some of it, I'm not happy about it when I read it, but it's consistent language. They can be on a pre-printed type form like this, or they're totally handwritten. So you got the parties of the first part, like Horace Brown, it designates that he is a free person. And then you got the second part, which would be the white folks that are hiring him. But what's interesting on here, we're coming through and it's given the terms. And this is up in Loudoun County, Virginia. And he's gonna work again for 12 months. But some of them go into a little more detail. And like this says, he's going to have $10 a month with proper and suitable food and quarters. The said parties hereby further agree that the sum is equal to one month's pay and so forth. But if we go back up and start up where they're talking about the sum of $120 for the whole term, and it says that Horace Brown hereby agrees faithfully and diligently to perform the duties of a labor. Well, I can't really claim percentages, but nine times out of 10, I'm finding that when these labor contracts come up, and again, don't, don't totally quote me on this, but you're probably looking at Horace's former slaveholder. These labor contracts where they would have basically given their life, free labor, and the whole nine yards. And now, because the war is over, we got the field offices up, he's going to get paid for it. But think about this. That is probably the former slave owner that he is going into a labor contract with. So here's an example of a different level. And we're seeing in-family search, remember I said there was different levels. Here's the assistant 
commissioner level, and they're labeled the United States Freedmen. So it just doesn't start off the Freedmen Bureau. It says United States Freedmen Bureau. So there's an index, there's the images, we're in family search. You can see the states. And so you would click on the state that you're researching and find out what records or what roles are in there. This is uh, Charlottesville Albemarle. They got roles 65, 66, and 67. So I can look at the contracts. I can look at the proceedings of court hearings. I can also look at the register of complaints and something for researchers, read the letters. Definitely read the letters. They could be orders that are coming from national or, you know, headquarters out of D.C. And they're telling the agents in the, um, the field offices directions or the, maybe they're responding to something from the Freedmen Court. Here's another example. And this was under destitute record. Again, Fluvanna. I'm going to see a name. I'm going to see the former owner. I'm going to see their condition and there's possibly any remarks. So if you look up Jacob and his former owner was Henry Woods and his condition is old age. When you're going through these Freedmen Bureau records from the field office level, you know, people had a choice of where they're going. And that's why the mapping site is really good to use. They might go to the closest to where they were enslaved at. Or they could go where family is at. Maybe they're in the next county and they go into that field office. But note that Jacob and Jolly do not, and so does Eliza, do not have a surname. They just have first name only. Okay. So here's another example. And list of the dependent on the government at Howard's Grove Hospital in Richmond, Virginia. Those of you that are in Richmond know what we're talking about when I'm talking about Howard's Grove. My friend Viola Baskerville is the one that um, pointed that out, that this was Central State Hospital. This record was done October 20th, 1865. We got names again and doing African-American research for us to get a name is priceless. And we got a location, right? And what they're saying is here's Matilda Williams and she was in Warrington, North Carolina, not Virginia, but we're in a Virginia record set. Then the one under there, Polly Johnston, Richmond City, Virginia, okay? Henrietta Johnston, Richmond City, Virginia. I would want to question these two and say, do they relate? How are they connected? They are right next to each other. And look, even in the next column, you see a Emma Johnston, Richmond City, Virginia. So you want to take it a step further. And basically, okay, I've got two Johnstons on here. Are they related? Here's another example of a ration record in 1866. And it, and I know it's a little hard to see, and I apologize for that, but this looks like it's the big spreadsheet one. Again, 1866 is the date, right? And this is military, so they're good on their paperwork. You got name, you got age, former residence before the war, your residence after the war, and you got the former master priceless information. This will aid in your research. Again, don't follow that lift, that myth that African Americans or whoever is conducting African ancestry uh, research cannot find people prior to 1870. Here's another type of ration record, and this is for a white family, and this is a wife of a soldier. So I, again, am getting a location, I'm getting name, and I also have a son, and they're saying that uh, Mr. Alford, uh, Miss Alford, who's the wife of a U.S. soldier, and her child, and they are in destitute circumstances. So, and you can see the inventory of what she was given, okay? And of course, the date was October, 
names and occupations, and did they take the oath? This is another one of the records like we saw before. So we got names on the left-hand side. We got ages, and we got occupation. Then they need to respond if they took the oath. And then the road or the location of the residents and it, whatever their gender is and remarks. So why would I show you this record if I showed you one and it mentioned about someone taking the oath earlier? Who do you think these folks are? And you guys can throw that in the chat. And, <laughs> you know, who do you think is taking an oath and why are these people taking an oath? OK, we're looking at James H. Milner, 31. He's a boatman. He took the oath. He's at the head of Holly Creek, which look at the location. All of them are clicking down until we get to Henry Nelson. He's at a different location. So you got to also think about this. So the occupations, we got a boatman. We got a housewife. We got a sailor. We got a housewife and we got farmers and we got laborers. And you know what? There's a seamstress. She didn't take the oath. It says not taken. Okay. Some of them say over in the remarks that they were not at home. He was out fishing. Think about it. This is uh, August 22nd, 1864, right? Who's taken an oath and who are these people? This is going to require you to put your thinking caps on and go back in and questioning who are these people and who's at this location? What is going on? They're taking an oath of something. So I want you all to think about that and share who do you think these people are? Because there's no race or color on here. OK. And remember, federal document. Here's a Buckingham County monthly report with some names on it. And this is a report on the destitute freedmen that were in Buckingham. This is just one page. You know, I don't even remember how many page, but they were issuing rations. But you're getting the names of who was there receiving this service. And you want to scan through here. It's telling you, are they a male or female? How many children? associated with them, and then how much stuff did they get in any remarks. Again, look down at the bottom, you got Joel Price. He's a Garrett's Orphans. That's a remark. I'd be wanting to know who the Garrett is, who's in that county with that last surname, you know, what happened to the parents, you know, because there's three children here, right? And there's no parents. And again, it's telling you they're orphans. Formerly enslaved, former slave owner in their status. Another field office record. And it's giving you names and the former slave owner. We spend hours as researchers trying to find this. And also we're getting their condition. You know, if we're lucky enough to get their age, then we can back in and track to the ancestors or possibly to the parents. So here's some examples. We got Ephraim Smith in the Coles family. Anytime you start genealogy uh, research, not just African-American, but any type of genealogical research, you always start off with what you know. This is the same thing I even do for my UVA research, uh, finding descendants of the enslaved laborers. I got to write down what I know, okay? So I know that Ephraim Smith was born about 1822, and he was born in Albemarle County. I know he was enslaved. I know he was enslaved by the Cole family because a friend of mine, and I'll show you in a minute, there was an estate record um, that was listed out that was transcribed, and the owner was Tucker Cole. I didn't know what happened to Ephraim after being enslaved. So I wanted to know if he accessed the Freedmen's Bureau for any services. So yes, did I check the slave schedule for 1850 and 1870? Of course, yes, I did. But you go back and forth, you know, trying to research getting prior to 1870. So let's see what happened uh, to Ephraim Smith after, you know, he becomes free. 
All right. So, you know, there's the 1850 slave schedules that are out there. So I want to find out first to validate, was there a Tucker Coles as the slave owner? I'm going to the slave schedule. They're only 1850 and 1860, and they report only the slaveholder or who had permission that's overseeing a plantation or whatever. I can't say 100% it's always a slaveholder because it could be an overseer that was there that day the census was taken. And so then it's going to list how many females right? Their age and what their color was. That's what's on the slave schedule. The enslaved folks are not listed by their name. Don't believe what you might hear on TV and things like that. And it's pretty hard to validate a lot of times on who that person is, because you know what? You could have five people that's age 30 that are a male. And again, these ages are typically estimates as close as they could remember or know of. So I found Tucker Coe's. You can see the arrow. And look what it says. That was 1850. He's in Albemarle County. And he enslaved 117 individuals. And again, you don't see names. You only see that gender and you see their ages and their color. And we know that the folks that were enslaved were more than just a line on a form. They did have names. Can't guarantee that they had a surname. And I can't say that they took on the slaveholder's surname. That's another myth that they all did. No, they didn't. You know, and as you learn to use these record sets, you'll note that some of them had names and some of them did not carry the slaveholder's name into the future. They had that one choice once they became free, they can take whatever name they want, okay? So here you can see the transcribed, as I mentioned, as Sam Tyler, who's out of Charlottesville, a very, very um, wonderful researcher and, and helps us with the historical society there and also the genealogy groups. But he transcribed this, okay? So you see Ephraim's name and his value, $1,100. These are documents that I'm looking at when I'm researching for the enslaved laborers. Not only do I research just the enslaved laborers, I also have to research the slaveholders or the white families. Because doing African-American uh, research, you have to do both. They're there together. They're in the neighborhood. They're in the county, the city, whatever. Do not just try to research African-Americans and not do the white family. African-Americans are part of the record. They did not create the law. They did not create the record, right? Those things were created by the whites that were there, be the lawyers, whoever it is. But no, you want to be able to follow where that comes from and how to connect it to the enslaved person that you're looking for. So looking through using this to complement what might be in the Freedman Bureau is how you want to kind of get the question, you know, get some questions answered. And then last week, I think I shared that genealogy is about time, place, and asking questions. So I'm seeing Efren Smith on here, and his value is 1100. So we're seeing names, and this was done in 1860. It's an estate of um, Tucker Coles. And these are the list of the folks that were on the document. And I have the actual document, but it's hard to read. And so I had took Sam's transcription. But look at the values that's there. Yes, these are humans. And they are listed in this record in 1860, again, before 1870. So here, look what I found. Ephraim, of course, we know it's free, freedom time because this record was done in 1866, March. The war is over. Here's a labor contract with Ephraim Smith with Peyton Coles. Well, because I research 
Tucker Coles, I found that he had a brother named Peyton Coles and his daddy's name was John Coles, huge slave owners in the area. So anyway, Efren does the labor contract right back at the plantation where he was enslaved at. Okay, and they're designated for the period of 12 months, you know, and um, what he's going to receive proper and suitable food in quarters. Okay, and also they're talking about you got to have witnesses on here. This is your standard pre printed contract for a labor contract. And again, his mark is down there and there's witnesses to the document that he's signing on because now he's going to get paid for the work that he's doing. Went to the 1870 census just to show the progress and you got Efren Smith, you're seeing him with his age, his race, right, and his gender, and he's a farm laborer and he was born in Virginia and so forth, okay? And again, toggling from uh, the state record, to Freedman Bureau, and to the 1870 census. Number two, let me show you a little bit about Nelson Price. Again, I start off with what I know. And it, my job at UVA is to lo locate descendants of the enslaved laborers. Well, Nelson Price is on my list. OK, and and it was odd because I said, oh, he's got a surname. So that means where did he get it from? But was it the slave owner? OK, so did not know if he was married or had any children. Of course, my goal would be to find out if he got married and had any children, because this is how I'm going to lead up to finding descendants. So on my list, I know he was rented to UVA by uh, Edbert Watson, and that was 1863 through 1865. So what at UVA, what was going on, the professors could bring their, their enslaved folks and rent them to the university for laborers, be it brick masons, carpenters, or whatever. And the students were not allowed to bring their enslaved individuals or families on the grounds of the uh, university. So I got a slaveholder's name, I got an enslaved person's name, and I know the times that he was rented to UVA. So again, I've got time and I got a location. I don't know anything about Edbert Watson, but I know that Nelson has the last name Price. So again, I'm thinking of my research plan and I'm about to go after that, okay? All right, so I built a tree on Edbert Watson Sr. And you can see the wife and, and kids and stuff. So he's the slaveholder, he's white, and look at his parents, John London Watson Sr. And his mama's name is Jane Howard Price. Ding, ding, ding. Wonder where Nelson came from. And Nelson Price, the enslaved laborer. Yes. And her dad is Richard Price, who is also on my list because he rented other people, you know, to the university as laborers. And those laborers are the ones that built that university, basically for Thomas Jefferson. So again, I had to research that white family in order to see where that price might have came from. I might not be that lucky because, again, there's no magic in genealogy. You know, this was an opportunity that presented itself and it worked out. Not going to be that way in every situation. OK, now, Jane Price could have received Nelson maybe as a gift when she got married to the Watson and so forth. So I now know that Edbert Watson, who rented him, was in Albemarle County. But mama and daddy were not in Albemarle County. I also found Nelson in the 1870s. So I jumped and said, OK, let me find out. Is he still carrying the Nelson name? I find him in Louisa County, Virginia, which is a county just right next to Albemarle. And also, 
of course, from the census, I have the children. So that would be a goal for me to come find descendants because now I have children to start researching each of those lines. And there was another household person, George Robinson. I don't know the connection, but again, my focus was on Nelson Price and the fine descendants. And again, coming from the Friedman Vero record, look what I found. I was accessing the records and I went to Louisa because that's where he was at in 1870. So I looked through the marriage records and, and one of my genealogy buddies that has Louisa ancestors, Marquita, you know, basically we're flipping through here, going through the Freeman Vero records, looking for her family. And I see this marriage record and look at 472 up towards the top where the arrow's at. There's Nelson Price. He's 48 years old and his wife is America and she's 46 and he's farming. But what's also significant on these marriage records, and here we're looking at Louisa, is we get a name. Look at 478, just as an example. We're seeing Henry there. And it says Henry and Judy. So we got their ages. He's a farmer. But look what the note says. So we got Henry. And it says, had a former wife, Sarah, living with another man had one child by her washington and he's living judy had a former husband named it looks like aaron brackstone she had by him two children both now living henry and robert oh my gosh this is a researcher's dream You got the former wife or spouse. You got the children being able to connect to which one of these wives he had. We run across this all the time. But in the Freedman Barrel, look what I can do with that. And look what I could go with this information. Here's an education plan for a Virginia classroom, because remember, not only did they provide relief services, there's also the portion where they set up the Freedman School. So this is one where they sketched out the drawing. And look at that, building the chairs of a school that was going to be in Warrington. Here's the census from Huntsville in Athens, Alabama. 1865, and it was the census of the Black residents. Again, I am getting names, age, sex, the street, the former owner, the occupation, and of course, the location of what county they're in. This is awesome information. These are not records to be ignored. You know, we're talking about the period between 1865 through 1872. Yes, we can find African Americans that were formerly enslaved and also free people before the 1870 census. So here's another example of the Bureau sending out information to the field offices and it's coming out of Richmond. It's a circular and it's basically telling everybody that they can inform now the freedmen that they are entitled to register to vote and it's telling the name, the place and where they go. This is Southampton County. Just as another example, this is information coming in from headquarters going into the field offices. Records of renting and leasing about the abandoned property. Remember the proper name of the bureau. So there's unbound records about the renting and leasing of the property between 1863 to 1865. In the bureau, it's arranged by the type of the record. So what you're seeing is former plantations being uh, leased. And they give the names of the leases, the names of the plantation, how many freed people were employed, and the number of acres that, you know, is being farmed. You got lists and rows of freedmen that are on those plantation records. 
you got applications to rent those abandoned lands. They could set up so people from the field offices have a place to stay. One of the things I want to say also, as an example, say I'm looking in the Virginia field office records, I might find documents for another field office from another state. So again, you want to go through, scan through, read as much as you can and, and look at these, um, these record sets and see how they're connecting. We are learning what's going on in a community at the time after the Civil War. And already remember up in the beginning, the Bureau said that one of their, their failures was being understaffed and underfunded, but also you had the issue in the violence in the threats from the Southerners that didn't want anybody to help those formerly enslaved people or help the free people. And so, but you're getting list of names and that's what's key when we wanna research. So here's just a receipt here, a land order for a Richard Brown in 1865. And it was permission for him to take possession and occupy these 40 acres that was in an example here was St. Andrew's Parish in South Carolina. So a quick recap, and I think we're doing good on time is, you know, now you know various ways how to access the Bureau of Records. I showed you Ancestry, uh, Family Search, used the Mapping the Freedmen Bureau site, I exposed you to various different types of the records, right? Uh, marriage records, ration records, labor contracts. I didn't show you a transportation record. And what is a transportation record? Well, maybe I come to the Freedmen Bureau and I say, my name is Shelly Murphy and my wife and children had been sold over to Alabama so-and-so. The Bureau is going to arrange for transportation for me to get to Alabama, okay? We, I also talked about hopefully no longer that you believe in those myths that's out there and they are continuing to be out there. And everybody sees the shows on TV and stuff. People are finding their ancestors prior to 1870. Yes, and they have names. And we're calling out those names and making sure that people access them and be able to find their ancestors. You also can realize, join in a genealogical group or a historical society, you know, or getting you a genealogy buddy to, you know, go through these records together is powerful. We hold a session every Friday at seven o'clock on just working through the Freedmen Bureau record. It's open, anybody can attend. You know, you got OGS members, you got different genealogy groups and things and um, that are there and they're helping everybody, you know? And if you got a brick wall, ask the question. You know, it's an open Zoom. So hopefully, <coughs> excuse me, We've encouraged you to look at the Freedmen Bureau during that time and realize the value of the records. And so I just want to say thank you and good luck on your journey and uh, continue to dig for your roots. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Murphy. Is that enough information I, that we're I, sharing today? I don't know how you do it. You just, I mean, it's just- This so is my favorite set. This it's is my favorite. Really, yeah, I can it tell. Is. I can yeah. tell. It is. Um, it's remarkable. Uh, with all the information, I remember when I first started on my journey in uh, looking for my ancestors, and I just thought, you know, it was really small. I'm like, oh, but yeah. now listening to you and all of the other wonderful Augs and and Augs members, it's it's just it's so much information. But it, yeah. and it's so much on what we're having brick walls on. Yes. And for those that are researching African ancestry, if they made it through, you know, uh, one of the challenges that I have with the UVA research is I might be looking at somebody that was rented in 1820. First thing, did they make it to the Freedmen Bureau and yes. did they access for service? Not everybody went to the Freedmen Bureau, right. but 
right now we're looking at almost 4 million records that are available to look at wow. in all the various states and on these rows. And it is worth the time. And the court hearing records are just absolutely, absolutely fascinating on Amazing. what people were going through. And of course, we got the violence that we're seeing that happened even after they were free. So again, they're gems, real gems. Well, I am just glad that we recorded the session because I'm going to take bits and pieces of the <laughs> session and work on it. So thank you again for being here. We do have some questions. But okay. First, I want to thank all of the OGS and ASALA members. I am so great, grateful that you all have joined us to the, here today. I do want to give a special shout out as I look through the um, participants today. I did see our national president, Dr. Ah. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham here. I want to acknowledge that she is here. Thank you for being here. You, She's always at as many um, sessions as any of our branches have. She is there. She's listening. Awesome. Um, and so thank you for being here, Dr. Evelyn mm -hmm. Hagenbotham. So let's look here at our questions. Okay. Um, initially, our first one, Monique Bunch. Did the formerly enslaved prior to 1865 typically bank with the Freedmen's Bureau Bank or would they be found in the record sets of record set 105 for the Freedmen Bureau? Having difficulty finding my relatives in these records and have wondered if because they have been freed many years before, they did not register for assistance or have their legal contracts, legal contract records recorded. And, and she's given a logical reason why they might not be in the records because they were free, but free people and white people also access the bureaus. Okay, so the only way is to get through those records, but also don't look just in the county where they lived, check the neighboring counties or the neighboring field office by chance that they might have been to the next field office. And so I can't give you a definitive answer to say they're not there just because they didn't access it because it might not be that situation. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a logical one. But again, they might not be if you say Charlottesville and Albemarle because that's where they were enslaved. But you know what? They access the bureau in Louisa, another county or Richmond, and they went to Hanover. And so I think just to do a little more due diligence and look at the neighboring field offices and find out or look at 1870, is that a different place where they were freed at? Are they in a different county? And, and backtrack from there. Yeah, you, you showed me that there are different um, field offices. When I saw that map, I was like, I love that never little thought, map. <laughs> never thought about looking around. So that was. Yeah. That's great information there. All right. So next question from Alice Harris. In researching on ancestry, should you start broad, e.g. surnames only, or more specifically, first and last names of ancestors? Any other suggestions for search terms to use? I use them all. I use them all. And, and one of the things, and again, one of the big challenges I have with the UVA research is because I have so many with first name only. And the first thing I think of is probably to go to the 1870 census and how many African-Americans say Bobs are there in Albemarle County if I can find a slaveholder, but I don't see a surname for the enslaved. So I'm gonna start very broad and just keep going. But one of the things that I also don't have is the location of where the slaveholder's at. So I narrowed in, just like setting a goal for my research, you know, for this project, I set the goal of the area that I'm researching. I focus just in on Central Virginia because they're close to Thomas Jefferson. And so all of the counties that are surrounding, which doesn't mean they didn't come from somewhere else. But where they got rented at, yes. So I would take any avenue and start logging. I mentioned this the other night. Well, actually, on Freedmen Bureau Friday, I think it was. And, you know, as you are researching and how you do it, start writing that down. 
So you're creating your checklist for that next person that you're doing. You know, if you access the Freedman Bureau or you access somebody's archives or you access certain, you know, probate records. And by the way, Virginia, for the folks researching Virginia, Ancestry.com, just put the probate records back up the wills and probates for Virginia. So they are on Ancestry. They had taken them down, but they are back up there. And this was just within the last 30 days. Great, thank you, thank you, thank yeah. you. Uh, Tanya Cumber says, what does the oath entail? Oh, well, just that they're not gonna enslave anybody anymore. They're gonna be loyal to the United States, that type thing. Yeah. All right. They're going to be good folks from now on. All right. Yes. <laughs> Ransom um, I said, hello, she hello, Shelly. Great presentation. As you know, West Virginia did not become a state until 1863. Before that, it was a part of Virginia. Would the Freedmen's Bureau records entail the part of West Virginia that was once Virginia? Marlene Ransom. Hi, Marlene. I research, well, you want to call it West Virginia, but I research Virginia, which includes West Virginia, I'll say it that way. And um, Jefferson County, as an example, which is now called West Virginia, did not even have a field office. So, um, and that's just the northern area where I research. What's critical is to understand that you're going to have to toggle from West Virginia archives and say the Library of Virginia, you know, or NARA and things like that. I have been probably researching the West Virginia side now, maybe about 15 years. And, and I actually mentioned this to Ancestry because that 1863 date you know, that you put out when they broke away and became West Virginia, they tell me all the records prior to that date are still in Virginia. And Virginia tells me that all those records were given to West Virginia. My second great grandparents were married, according to the Bible, June 19, 1863. West Virginia broke off June 20th. 1863. So I have been back and forth. I just say keep looking and asking questions. But I tapped in with the West Virginia archives. But um, if I didn't emphasize it enough, I think going local is more the option. And I don't find a lot of field offices that were around in West Virginia today, you know, I don't see a lot of them. So I think they would have tapped into Virginia, that area where I research, I find my, I'm going to say my West Virginia folks in Clark County, or in Frederick County, Virginia, because it was the closest to Jefferson County. And also you got the headquarters uh, in D.C. that is 70 miles away from that Jefferson County, and I'm just using that as an example. And, and for folks that don't know about Jefferson County, you actually do because that's where Harper's Ferry is at and the whole John Brown raid and all of that. So, But there was not an office in those associated counties field office. So I went to the national, I mean the state office, and then the surrounding Virginia counties. And, and again, I can't really give you a accurate because I just keep trying and I still have yet to find them in uh, uh, Virginia counties, but I know the route when they left Virginia. So that was a strategy I was coming up with to go to Clark County and then go to Frederick County heading out because they headed to Ohio after the Civil War. Wonderful, wonderful. That, so there's here's another oath question. Please excuse my this is Cheryl S. Please excuse my ignorance. When you mention taking the oath, what is the nature of the oath and who is eligible to or must take this oath? Thank you. Okay, and taking the oath, you think about it, you had two sides to the war per se, right? You had Union and you had the Confederates. 
right? And so now the war is over. We're supposed to be the United States now, because remember the Southern states became the Confederate United States. So they were not United States people. So they need, just like back during the Revolutionary War, the folks had to take an oath that they're either gonna be loyal to the crown or they're gonna be loyal to America or the United States, what becomes United States of America. It's the same thing during, the civil war who are you loyal to and you know what if you want services this that and other you're going to take that oath to be with the united states in one example um talking about civil war and taking an oath um you had slave owners that were able to um manumit their slaves and allow them listen to this, allow them to fight on the union side. But what, yes, and but what, and I'm going to tell you why, but what they had to do was number one, show proof that they own that person. So they had to show certificate of title. These records are on fold three and certificate of title says, I own this person or I purchased this person from so-and-so. So you can get some great information for there. And it says, I've owned them since then, this, that, and the other, or they were born on my plantation, so on and so forth. And then he basically manumits them, frees them, and he receives $300. So you got the point. And he's taken the oath not to have slaves anymore in this, that, and the other. These records are on fold three. So go find them and they're connected with the U.S. colored troops because that means you had a slave owner that frees their enslaved person and they go, they're able to go fight for the union. But I'm getting $300. Right, right. <laughs> wow. So yeah, yeah. So there's a reason. There, there, there's a reason. You know, there's a reason. And it was the money. It was the you money. Know. It's all, it was all, the, money. All the money. Follow yeah. that. You know, I said, <laughs> follow the money, follow, follow the, the money. land, follow the water, mm -hmm. follow the community and follow the faith of the people. And, and a lot of times for these field offices, I'm going to say they're local. And, and a lot of us genealogists and things, and a lot of folks that are here, you know, you have to hit that local level. You got to hit the courthouses. You got to see the cemeteries, you know, get to the historical societies, get to the public library, your universities and your colleges and things. And the Library of Virginia is probably one of the most premier libraries in the country. The records there are unbelievable. And so you can access the majority of them right online. Which I love. Yes, it's my favorite <laughs> library. <laughs> so we will probably have to get back with you, Monty, but she wants to know if you can refer her to a researcher who is skilled in Greensville County, Virginia, and close by, and for Del Rio, Tennessee. She'd like to perhaps hire persons to help her and her email address is there. Well, yeah, one of the things she can email me and, and you could always find me on Facebook under Finding Enslaved Laborers to UVA, send me a message. But one of the things you can also check what's called APG site. You have researchers that take clients that are here now um, that are in that chat room right now. And I see a few of them that might be familiar with your area, but you can check the APG site but the other thing is I would cir circulate or scan through the Facebook pages. Is there a Green County or Greenville County genealogy Facebook page or the one that the other one that you're looking for and get in there and make that connection and see if you can find somebody that's there. You can always tap into your OGS chapters and find out who's taken clients. Is there one in that location or who's the closest one? And again, what specifically are you looking for is going to be the first thing they want to know. Okay. Wonderful. So Dr. Margaret Bristow, oh, Margaret Bernice Smith Bristow, highly commend you on this provocative presentation, which galvanizes us to research even more. 
Just wondering about the over 50,000 formerly enslaved and the Bureau educated in Virginia between 1865 and 1870, two of whom were the brothers of Dr. Carter G. Whitson's mother and Eliza Riddle Whitson. So are you are you wondering about, is that a question? Yeah, it sounds like she's making a comment. And and anything Carter G. Woodson, I go right to UVA <laughs> because they have a whole department on Carter G. Woodson and any of the, you know, the research that happens through there and uh, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think she's making a comment. Yes. I wasn't because yes. I didn't see a question. So the Honorable Viola Baskerville says, talk about any resources available for the freedmen to argue their cases. The court hearings? I'm sure. Is that I'm Viola, is that what you're talking about? It, it's just so many, it's unbelievable. And here's a quick example. I know we might be running out of time, but here's a quick example. Uh, and it was like, oh my gosh. And, and we were discussing this on Freedmen Fridays, but you had a woman. Again, Freedmen Vero is after freedom right? The 13th Amendment, they has not passed it, but you're supposed to be free, you know, this, that, and other. She went to court, the Freedmen Court, because that former slaveholder was still holding on to her three children. And he was using those three children, you know, and stuff. And I, and I don't know if Vicki is in the audience, but she can comment on that also in the chat. But we were looking through the case and there, you know, the building of evidence, the bureau's portion is to, to, uh, you know, see a resolution come because you got two parties. We have seen where they're trying to get their children back. We have seen that there's violence where we see the former slave owner is still beating and also raping their formerly enslaved person and they're free because they're trying to get away. They're, they're not tied to that plantation anymore. So there's harassment going on. Like I said, the violence that's going on. There's a whole role on a lot of these field offices and they're called the outrages, murders and outrages and, and things like that. Or it could be a dispute about their labor contract, you know, because when you're reading through these these labor contracts, I'm sorry, or these court hearings, or they filed a complaint, sometimes you're looking at, I'm going to call it the beginnings of the sharecropping system, because those formerly enslaved people are now under contract, and everything that they're doing and growing, they got to give some back to that former slave owner, and again, think of them and doing the research because that's probably the former slave owner. They're hard to give up that free labor that they had for years and years and years. It's a horrible situation and the violence is there, but you need to read through there because you're also getting the temperature of what's going on in that community. Because if somebody's showing up to that court hearing or they're showing up to the field office and they're saying, I'm filing a complaint because of this, it could be theft, it could be, uh, you know, some form of abuse in the wrong, uh, you know, problems during the contract and so forth. It is just unbelievable what you read and you think it should be over. You think it should be, uh, it's not. And, and again, and I'm going to say this, we're in 2021. We are still seeing yeah. some of that saga continue from when we're talking about things after the Civil War ended. And again, what do we need to do? We need to tell these stories. I encourage everybody that's here to please research, you know, this collection. Yes, it's, I'm passionate about it. It's my favorite, <laughs> you know, and things because it's really key for me to find enslaved laborers mm -hmm. in, in connecting with UVA. But you know what? I'm also watching to see if my second great grandfather is going to show up in one of those Freedmen Bureau um, records. So you want to be able to share that information that is so factual and right. you got time, you got place and you got 
the whole situation being unre you know revealed and again i want to the white folks that are here your people are in these records as well you know don't skip this period for any reason if they were poor and needed help they went to these bureaus just like the formerly enslaved wow I, every time I, every time I, I get I out a soapbox, I love this collection. It's, it's and wonderful. there's so many of us that love this collection and it's yes. aided because again, we're getting a marriage. We're getting mm -hmm. children, children. We're getting named. We're looking at the USCT colored troops that are get assistance to get their pay that they were due, yes. you know? Yeah. So it's awesome. Well, we we are just about out of time. We are okay. going to save this, um, save the the Q and A, so that I'm going to send it to you, Shelly, so that okay. you, Dr. Murphy, so that you can um, look over. Um, Renata just put information in the chat about Freedom Fridays. Um, okay. People were asking Great. about Freedom Fridays. I am going to join Freedom Fridays one of these days when I don't have lots of stuff to do, but I need to get into this really, really soon. Can I uh, warn? Can I warn yeah. folks? Oh, about you, Friedman you Bureau Friday. You do have to warn them. It starts at seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time. This past Friday, we stopped at 2.30. Prior to that, 2.30, 3.30, whatever we're on a roll on, we're on it. We're going. I usually bow out about 2.30 and they just keep going. <laughs> so it's a plethora of information. Yes. And um, I will be there. I don't know if I can stay up till 2.30, but <laughs> if, if I find some information, like one of your slides said, um, the rations from Buckingham County, which were, is where my mother's side of the family is from, oh, is okay. a Hannah Gilliam. Um, and Gilliams are a part of my family, so I'm going to go back to that. And you bit. also know Buckingham connects with Viola Baskerville, right? Hey, oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's Miss. That's Miss Buckingham, Buckingham County, right, right there. there. Yeah, absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Doctor Murphy, right. for your wonderful, wonderful presentation today. I am just elated, and I'm glad again that we recorded this. Someone else said in the chat. Thank you for recording it. She was taking pictures. She was trying to write things down. The information is phenomenal. Yes, I do appreciate want to it. And I'm so glad folks came out. I just want them to use this record set. We just don't have enough coming out, you know, right. as far as telling those stories. And if we don't tell it, nobody's going to know about those Nobody's folks. Nobody's going to know. And that's the reason gonna... why we're doing what we're doing today. And I appreciate you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone, for joining Asala, Richmond, Virginia, Sunday sit-ins, sponsored by AARP and partnering with AUGS, Richmond, Virginia. Next week, we are going to have Dr. Tanya Matthew, CEO of the International African American Museum, and Dr. Shelley Murphy. Y'all going to get real tired of me. <laughs> no, we're not. No, we're not. <laughs> As they talk about the museum the, in, Char in Charleston, South Carolina, and yeah. also talk about the Center for Fam of the Center for Family History, that is going to be exciting. I can't wait to sit in on that one as well. And then the last November Sunday, November twenty eighth, yeah. is massive resistance, passive insistence, the desegregation of high school athlete af athletics in Central Virginia after Brown versus Board of Education 1954. Now, we've put the registration links in the chat, but if you cannot find a registration link, you can go to Asala Richmond, it's Asala RVA Facebook page, and we have the links there. And you can also find the links at AARP Virginia. I wanna thank our sponsors again, AARP Virginia, for sponsoring this series, as well as they sponsored our last series. And I want to thank Augs Richmond, Virginia, for being here and partnering with us. It is 5.30. I can't believe we did it in that amount of time. It was such good information. I thank everyone. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Have a great Appreciate one. Appreciate it. Thanks, Bye -bye. all.